Jesus, thank you so much, Lord, for your word, and thank you for uh, bringing us all out tonight. Lord, I ask that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, and if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, that they would hear the gospel and that they would respond uh, to your word, Lord, and that they would come and enter into that relationship with you. I pray that you would use me, Lord, to, to just speak forth your word and that you would, uh, that you would be glorified, Lord, and that you would uh, allow us to know uh, you and uh, that we would be equipped thoroughly, Lord, in your word and that we would know your word uh, to be able to go out and, and present your word to others as well. And so we just thank you for who you are and uh, for what you're doing here in the fellowship as well, Lord. I thank you for this fellowship. Thank you for Pastor Dwight. And uh, just pray that your, your word would be uh, glorified tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name, and magnified. Amen. Amen. So, um, what was I going to say? I forgot already. All right. That's a good start. Um, well, let's just start. If you guys could open up your Bibles to John chapter 3. We're going to be talking about the gospel today. And... Um, Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 12. I'll just quote you guys a few few verses here too. Um, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Paul says to the church of Philippi, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's a very interesting verse if we're going to be talking about the gospel because when we came to the Lord did we work out our salvation with fear and trembling? And I think it's something that we should consider. Are we in the fear of God? And I think we need to uh, understand who God is. And in fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And understand true salvation is because of God's grace and now you can appreciate his grace until you really you can't appreciate his grace until you come to know and, and uh, fear and tremble uh, before his presence really so um, know that one day everyone every single knee is going to bow before the Lord uh, and remember this is God we're talking about this is the Lord the creator of the universe who created you know the, the the universe I mean come on all the way down to the very cells that we know of um, we're gonna bow before the Lord and the sad thing is uh, some will say you know um, this is what the Lord may say to some people he'll say I never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness you who practice iniquity and I'm kind of choking up already, just the thought of that. It's a, it's, a, it's a sad thing. You know, even Satan, he knows who God is. He trembles before God's word. He knows God's word. And, and uh, man, many are going to say, you know, but Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? And we, but they were deceived. And, and maybe they heard, you know, some other gospel. Maybe they didn't tremble and they didn't fear before the Lord. And when we come before the Lord, uh, may we come with that awe and that respect and that, you know, just understanding that God is much more mightier, much more powerful um, than we are in our little brains, right? Because some of us think that we're, we're this, you know, and, and when you come before the Lord on your knees, you're, you're, you don't mess around with God, and God ain't messing around. You look at this verse, and I, I just, you know, there's just that shaking, you know, that we should have as believers, that we should just wake up if we're caught in our mundane Christian walk, if you will. Uh, we need that fear before the Lord. So examine yourselves, the Bible even says. You know, rather you are in the faith, and it's a good thing. So for those who are here uh, that may have, you know, you may have come to church all your life. Maybe you've, you know, you, 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 you love Christianity, you have a lot of Christian friends, you, you love the Bible, um, but just consider, examine your own self, you, examine your, your heart before the Lord, if you really are in the faith. I think it's a good challenge that Paul gave to all of us, um, so it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and start off with what the gospel is not. First of all, the gospel is not, um, you know, giving tracts to people. Okay, I've, I've given tracts to people. I still give tracts to people, but that's not giving the gospel. 
right? I go to people and I'm like, oh, what'd you do today? Oh, I gave the gospel. You did? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I gave the gospel to like 300 people today. Yeah. What'd you do? What'd you say? Oh, I just gave them a track. No, that's not giving the gospel. It's not inviting people to church. I've, I've heard people say all the time, oh, I was giving the gospel today. Really? What'd you say? Oh, I told them that they should come to church today. And I was like, uh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I just invited them to church. No, that's not the gospel. Uh, it, the gospel is not the Bible. The gospel is not the Ten Commandments. Sometimes uh, there's some people that I knew that, you know, they, you guys know the, the, um, the Ray Comfort style, you know, where they, they present the Ten Commandments and um, that some people, they just give the Ten Commandments and they say, see, you're a sinner. Goodbye. See you later. And that's not the, the gospel. I'm not saying that he doesn't give the gospel, but just pointing people to the Ten Commandments and saying, see, you're a sinner. Recognize you're a sinner. Good job. Um, that That's not the gospel. So um, we, we all... Um, well, I could keep going, but you guys get the picture there? That's no, okay, all right, we're, get, we're starting off pretty good. The gospel. Okay, turn to John 3 if you're already there. First of all, understand that when the gospel is mentioned in Scripture, it's always accompanied by the definite article. Um, it's the gospel. It's the gospel. It's not a gospel, okay? There's no such thing as many gospels. There's a... Uh, uh, in fact, the only other gospel is a false gospel, okay? Uh, and understand who the gospel is for. In fact, if you're there in John chapter 3, look at verse 15. It says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So who is it for? It's for whoever, right? There you go. And, and the word whoever, by the way, um, it means whoever. <laughs> That's what it means. It means all, any, right? It's everybody. Anybody who wants it, you're able to receive it. Uh, in John chapter 3, verse 16, uh, it says, For God so loved the elect. Oh, wait. Is it right? Yeah, that's what it says, right? God loves the elect only that he... What does it say? World. The world. What does that mean? Everyone. That's right. That he, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So notice it doesn't say God, uh, God loves the elect only, right? Okay, I threw that in there on purpose to wake you guys up. Um, some people believe that God only came to this world and he died for those who would... Uh, who are the elect, and, and that's not the case. That's not what the Bible says. What the uh, the what this this verse really says in John chapter three verse sixteen, uh, the reason that God sent His Son to you and me is what? It's at the end of verse sixteen that we might have eternal life. That's the purpose right there. That's the answer. John ten ten um, even says. You know, the thief doesn't come but to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And, and that's the, there it is. So, uh, in fact, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For I am, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for the, and then it goes on. But notice the gospel is for everyone who believes. Did I drill drill that to you guys? There's some people who are probably mad at me in here right now, so don't be too mad, but that's okay. It's for everybody. Um, okay, let's go ahead and if you're still in John chapter 3, uh, let's start in verse 1. And the context, by the way, is all about being born again. That's what we're going to talk about right now. In fact, that word born uh, is geneo. It's used eight times in the first eight verses already. And it means to bring forth, to reproduce. And it's linked with the word again, which is an interesting word, that word again. Uh, it means an, an o, anothen. Anothen is, is how you pronounce it in the Greek. It means from above, from a high place. And it's being born again means being reproduced from above. Being spiritually rebirth, if you will, or spiritual uh, regeneration. There's a big word for you. Uh, so it's not about being on the outside. Um, it's about the inside. It's the change that happens on the inside. It's not about the change that's the external, right? It's the internal. So let's go ahead and start. Here in verse 1, 
we're going to learn about the person who came to Jesus. Look at verse 1 and 2. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night. In fact, we'll, we'll just stop right there just so we all understand what's going on. So Nicodemus, he's, his name means, you know, ruler o over uh, his people. And according to verse 1, he's a Pharisee. And he's a ruler of the Jews, which is an interesting phrase, by the way, because it's it's that phrase is linked with the Sanhedrin. That's the 71 member uh, council. It's kind of like the Supreme Court of today kind of uh, a thing going on there. So, uh, in fact, in verse 10, uh, we see that this guy Nicodemus is a teacher of Israel. And so that becomes important because he's not just a, a, a teacher. He's a teacher of Israel. This is a big shot right here that we're talking about. The, the definite article proceeds the attributive noun. So he is the teacher of Israel, right? So in other words, he held an exalted position in the Sanhedrin, okay? So uh, because it's based on his knowledge or his experience or whatever the case may be. So this is a big shot guy right here. Verse 2, uh, this is when he came. He came by night. Interesting. Uh, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So ultimately, uh, we're, not, we're not told why Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Um, and uh, so obviously it's not that important, right, why he did. But it doesn't matter when you come to Jesus, the, the thing is that you come to Jesus. That's what matters, right? And, and because life is short, life is not guaranteed. Tomorrow is not promised, the Bible says, right? So for some of us in the room tonight, the reality is our life could be taken tonight or we may not see tomorrow. Isn't that interesting to even consider? It's like, whoa, that's, that's interesting. Um, in fact, uh, that's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. He says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In John chapter 7, Jesus says in verse 37, on the last, it, was, it says at the end, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So there's that invitation to come. In fact, in Revelation 22, 17, uh, this is our uh, theme for the prophecy conference that we had. It says, Jesus says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And in fact, in Isaiah 55, verse 1, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. This is, the, the invitation is nonstop. If you guys look it up, it really it's the theme of the word of God. It's constantly saying, come on to me. Come on to Jesus is what the theme is. In fact, from Malachi, I'm sorry, from Genesis to um, Revelation, we see that God is in the, the, he's in the business of redeeming man back to himself because of Adam and Eve, right? When sin entered into this world, we separated ourselves from God. And ever since then, from day one, well, not technically, literally, but from way back then, um, God's been redeeming us back, right? So that's what we read of when we start reading the first five books of the Bible, the law, then we go through all of them. We just see over and over the heart of God. And I'm, I'm in Isaiah right now, my, my devotions with the Lord. And it was really cool to see that God is saying, guys, you know, come back to me. You're not coming back. This is what I'm going to do if you don't come back. And he did. This is his judgments. This is his woes. And then he does. He, he carries out all of what he said he was going to do. And when he's doing that, he says, you know, when they're afflicted, he was, he's afflicted. And so it's not something God just wants to do for fun or something. It, he's afflicted when you're afflicted. And it's just not a fun place to be. Um, anyways, why am I talking about that? Okay. Let's go on. Look at verse 2. So uh, what, what did he say? And I think this is important right here in verse 2 that he came to Jesus by night. And he says, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs unless 
uh, who come from him. So uh, number one, he, he called Jesus rabbi, which is interesting because only students call their teachers a rabbi. And for Nicodemus, who's the teacher of Israel, who comes and he's speaking on behalf of all the Pharisees, it's very interesting because he recognizes Jesus as his rabbi. And, and, and uh, so it's, an, it's a badge of honor, if you will, a, a badge of respect in a sense there to say, hey, I recognize who you are and you're above me. And so I'm going to call you rabbi. In fact, he also, in addition to that, acknowledges what Jesus has done, right? It's the signs, the wonders, the miracles, and the things that Jesus was doing were, uh, were of God. So thus validating that Jesus Christ is the rabbi, right? Now, all of all the, keep, it, keep it in mind, all the honor that Nicodemus is giving to Jesus um, and, and, and all the acknowledgments he was giving to Jesus was still not enough. In fact, it still left him terribly short in realizing who Jesus is and what Jesus is all about. You see, Nicodemus, he, he had all the head knowledge. He had, he had it all up here, but he didn't have it down here to the heart, right? And, and that's where he fell short there. So the sad thing is that today, many people have fallen for this trap. A lot of people have. They come to honor Jesus as a great teacher. He's a great prophet because, you know, the signs and the miracles and the wonders that he did are just obvious. I mean, obviously he's of God and, and, and they look at that, but yet they've never bowed the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives because they love sin, right? Sin, sin is what keeps us away from the Lord. And, and uh, they never become born again because, like I said, everything's in the head right? They, they, they know the, what the Word of God says, but it never gets to the heart. They don't fall on their face before the Lord. To them, the Lord is just, you know, God bless this night, good night, or bless this food, do your job, goodbye, right? It's just one of those things. It's a mockery that people live out their life religiously into de being deceived, though, and thinking that they are born again. So it's it, we should caution in that. But let's look at verse 3. Here's the point that Jesus made. Look at, uh, It says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And, and the point that Jesus makes here is very significant. What I, I find interesting in verse 3 is that Jesus answers a question that wasn't even answered. It, it was never asked, right? <laughs> but he's answering it here. And, and Nicodemus, he never asked him about the kingdom. He never asked him about being born again. And yet Jesus is answering that question. And the question, why would Jesus even bring up that point, right? About being born again, about entering into the kingdom of God. So according to the end of uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 25, it says that, that Jesus, he knew what was in man. And what is in man? Nothing. What, what is it? it? There's nothing inside of man. Uh, what's inside of us prior to Jesus Christ is a void, if you will. And, and, and it's an emptiness of soul and heart, if you will. In fact, in Ecclesiastes, it says uh, that he's put eternity in their hearts. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, verse 20, he says, for creation was subjected to futility. And in the context there, we understand that there's just that void, there's that nothingness that was there before we even knew Christ. And that's why the, the terminology that Christians use of, you know, there's a gap in your heart or, or there's people that are searching for love in all the wrong places and they're trying to, they're trying to fill that gap in their heart. Because only God can fill that gap. Because God is love, according to First John, right? So, um, but but uh, I better slow down here. Here here's the gospel. You guys want the gospel? Here we go. I actually had to delete a whole bunch of notes because I got carried away on Nicodemus and other people, and I just like, oh, I gotta stick to the main point. Turn with me to First Corinthians, and then we're gonna go back to John three again. So, so we'll stay in there all day today. But First Corinthians chapter fifteen. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, look at verse 1. And this is Paul speaking here to the church of Corinth. And, uh, and he's, this is the gospel. If you guys want it all in a nutshell, here it is. Um, 
It says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you also are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, and here it is, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by uh, Cephas and the twelve, and it goes on from there, right? But there it is. Boom. Go back to uh, John chapter 3. So Jesus, why did he come to this world? For Because of the sins of man. He's redeeming man back to himself because he wants that relationship with man. And, and many of you in here understood that and gave your life, you responded to that call that the Lord had. And, and there it is. So, but there's a problem uh, that's presented to Jesus right here. Look, go back to John 3, go to verse 4. That was just a little, um, a little treat for you guys right there in 1 Corinthians. Uh, look at verse 4 of John chapter 3. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. So this problem was because of a lack of understanding, obviously, for Nicodemus. Nicodemus was thinking physically because that's the way he was trained as a Pharisee, to think uh, religiously, if you will. And, 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 uh, but Jesus was speaking spiritually, obviously. So Nicodemus was thinking about good works rather than a personal relationship with Jesus. And by the way, just to throw that out there, the Jews didn't seem... Uh, this terminology, born again, wasn't new to them. Whenever a Gentile would come to Judaism, they would use the same terminology as th they were born again, right? Because they're living uh, according to the Jews now. And so... Um, Look at verse 5. It involves water and spirit. It says, Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit... He cannot enter the kingdom of God. So part of entering the kingdom of God involves water and spirit. Interesting. It's not speaking of water baptism or water birth, if you will. It's speaking of water and word. Water and word. Wait, are you sure about that? Yeah. No, by the way, where, where the word of God is and the, the, the Holy Spirit, they're working together. And, and note in verse 5 that the preposition is missing before the word spirit. So Notice it doesn't say unless one is born of the, the water and of the spirit, right? It doesn't say that. So notice there's no pre pre preposition. So the grammar is such that it is linking the water and the spirit together. Very interesting. So the grammatically, if that's the case, and it is, uh, Ephesians 5.26 says um, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Interesting. The same uh, terminology is used right here. In fact, uh, a lot of you guys memorize this. Psalm uh, 119 verse 9 says, How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. So it's God's word which washes and cleanses us. And, and the Holy Spirit who comes and convicts us. And we know that the Holy Spirit comes to convict us in three areas. Is there any uh, Bible scholars in here? There's three areas that the Holy Spirit convicts us in. Number one, in sin, righteousness, and judgment. Good job. Ding, ding, ding over here. I heard it. Okay. Um, so he, the Holy Spirit seals us he saves us right and both of the word and the spirit are working together to make us born again at the moment before you gave your life to the lord it was the holy spirit who was leading you and guiding you to himself the holy spirit's job his ministry is always pointing to jesus he's always pointing to jesus and everything so it's by the name of jesus uh we're saved where there's power in the name of jesus in fact in first peter verse uh chapter 1 verse 23 it says having been born again not of corruptible seed but 
incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because of the word of God, we are born again. And that, that is why we place a huge importance, by the way, on the word of God at Calvary Chapel. You guys go to other churches in the area, um, and, and hopefully they teach the word of God. But there's a lot that I know that I looked at that where they didn't even mention the word of God. And they just kept, kept talking. And I was like, are you serious? Oh. But uh, Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. So uh, let's go back to verse 6. There's, there's the flesh and spirit. It says that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We're in John chapter 3, too, if anybody's lost. Um, so notice the word but is not used in this sentence. So Jesus is not making a contrast. In fact, he's using the word and. And so he's making a comparison. He's comparing the two, the flesh and the spirit. And the common denominator in, in uh, comparing the flesh and the spirit, according to verse 6, is the word born. So it's not about the flesh or the spirit, but about the word being born. So born, by the way, um, it is ganeo. So it means to bear, to bring forth, to reproduce is that word born. And the point of verse 6 is very simple. If we're not born again, then we're in the flesh. And the flesh is going to reproduce the flesh. That's all it reproduces, right? But if we're born in the, of the Spirit, then the Spirit's going to produce this, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit, right? The, the flesh can only produce the fruit of the flesh, which is rottenness and filthiness and it stinks, right? It's gross. But the, the Spirit is going to produce in us, which we know in Galatians chapter 5, there's a whole list of them, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, and that's singular, by the way, when I say the word fruit. And in fact, um, because of his love, we're going to naturally produce those other eight qualities um, just naturally because we have his love in us. By the way, there's nothing good in us, right? Amen? You guys with me on that? Okay. So if there's nothing good in us, then what? nothing good can be produced out of us, right? So uh, if, if we are sinners and we we understood it we gave our life to the lord and now his life is living in us then then he's naturally going to be producing uh what's good out of us because only he is good right amen amen yeah. amen all right look at verse seven it says do not marvel that i said to you you must be born again uh, the wind blows, so obviously he's marveling at him. So his face is looking at Jesus like, what? <laughs> he's, he's like, Nicodemus, don't marvel. Come on. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Uh, in fact, in verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Wow, there's the question for Jesus. And this seems to be like a, a simple question. After all, Jesus, he just got done about, you know, talking about being born again and entering the kingdom of God. And then in uh, verse 4, uh, Nicodemus even asked him, how can a man be born when he is old? <laughs> and Jesus began to teach him. Uh, he was teaching him, uh, uh, it's not about a physical birth, but about a spiritual birth, right? And, and so what does Nicodemus do in verse 9? Uh, he asked Jesus, how can these things be? And I find that interesting since Nicodemus didn't ask him why these things must be, but rather, um, how can these things be? So apparently he didn't have a problem with what uh, should happen as far as being born again, uh, but his problem was how it was supposed to happen. He was a Pharisee of the religious ruling, right? He was a ruler of the Jews, and Nicodemus was teaching that gaining an entrance into the kingdom of God was done through good works, basically. It involved external uh, righteousness is what it involved. 
Uh, it involved obeying the law of Moses. It uh, uh, involved uh, obedience to the Mishnah. It involved obedience to the uh, Talmud, which is the oral and the, the traditions of the Jews, basically. In other words, getting to heaven is based on your good works, okay? And, and Jesus is saying, look, Nick, it's not about your performance or your good deeds or your good works, right? Um, but getting to heaven is based solely on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection resurrection that's what it's based off of it's not based on you it's nothing it has nothing to do with you uh, and, and besides your you choose we have to choose to choose uh, how should I say this you have an option to choose him okay there's better there you guys um, and so it's a choice that you have you got you get to make with the Lord it's not like he's commanding you and you have to go get up there get upstairs to heaven right now okay Lord right you have a choice to go with the Lord if you want or not. So the sad thing is today, many have bought into that, that lie, though, of good works and thinking that somehow getting to heaven is based on my performance. That is, that's, that's, that's what separates Christianity from every single religion on the face of this planet is they say it's, it's man reaching to God by good works, right? By their good deeds, by their religious lifestyle. Christianity, biblical, I should say, is God reaching down to man by the finished work on the cross, by his good work, right? Which is his death on the cross. And, and it was Jesus 2,000 years ago who really saved humanity if they would only believe in him, if they would receive what he's done for them. So many don't understand that today though it's not about the law it's about love it's not about being religious it's about a relationship with jesus right um those things those things are going to keep you from being born again and so we got to be cautious uh, from thinking that you can be somehow and do something for god where he's going to be impressed right hey good job you did it you you finally made it look at that wow you can't please God. In fact, if you really looked at God through all your good deeds that you're doing for salvation, he's all that. <laughs> it's disgusting. They're like filthy rags to God, your righteousness. But his righteousness, which is accounted to your account, is it's beautiful, right? Because he sees himself. You're a reflection in a sense of him, church. Just like in your marriage, your wife, your, your spouse is a reflection of you, right? And, and this, so it's a, it's a beautiful picture how God made it from the very beginning. Anyways, um, look at verse 10. Here's the answers that Jesus starts to give to Nicodemus. Jesus answered and he said to him, are you the teacher, the master of Israel, and you do not know these things? So Nicodemus, man, he's the teacher of Israel. He knew the scriptures about Jesus in the Old Testament, right? He just didn't know how it was supposed to happen. That's, that's what he's, at, he's saying right here. Understand, you and I, we don't have to do more as a believer to stay a believer, okay? You don't have to maintain your believing status with God as if somehow it's going to fall apart if you don't, you know, put in whatever. Uh, no, Acts chapter... 20 verse 32 it says his grace is able to build you up it is grace that's able to build us up that's what paul told the ephesian elders there in um uh what is it miletus um and and that's uh as believers we grow and we're built up by the grace of god right it's by jesus christ it's by him doing his work naturally in us so why we, we're we need his grace, yes, for salvation, but we also need his grace to enable us for this everyday Christian lifestyle that we have, right? Because why? We fall on our face. Right? We fall short of the glory of God, and it's, it's not fun. So we need his grace. But the byproduct of his grace in our lives as believers now is, is he's naturally going to produce in you now so that you can do more, so that you can serve more, so you can give more. Now you're naturally doing those things, not from a burden standpoint as before, where you're like trying and sweating and you're attempting so that you can become more. No, you're, 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 uh, you're doing it because, because you already have your reward. It's Jesus, right? He's our reward. We're not working for anything else. So anyway, 2 Peter 3.18, it even says, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. So it's not a work of the flesh, but it's a work of the 
Spirit. All right, we're still awake. This is good. All right, verse 11, it says, Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. So Jesus is using plural um, uh, pronouns here, right? In verse 11, like we and our. And Nicodemus didn't receive our witness, so or his witness, so because of unbelief. Look at verse 12. If, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, there it is. He didn't believe them still. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So Nicodemus didn't even understand the words Jesus was saying in the earthly sense. How is he going to understand the spiritual sense? You know, just come on, man. Like the wind, you know, you can't see it, but it's there. We all know that the wind's there, but you can't see it. And it's kind of like we draw a picture of our faith in Christ. We, we, we can't see God, but, you know, we understand that he's there. Obviously, there's the, the he's the creator of the universe. There's, there's uh, his fingerprint, if you will, there, right? Um, anyways, Nicodemus couldn't understand, and he couldn't understand for a reason. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Have you guys ever come up to your family or your friends who don't know Christ and you're trying to explain to them this awesome Bible study that you just heard or, or something that God just showed you in the Word? And it, to you, it's like, right? You're like, wow. And you're like, guess what? Guess what the Lord just showed me? This is so cool. This is amazing. Check it. Oh, look at that. Isn't that great? And they're like, you're weird, right? <laughs> what's wrong with you? And you're like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> right? This is amazing. But um, yeah, we see things from a, a heavenly standpoint, but they see things from a worldly standpoint. They just, they can't. They just can't. Even if they wanted to try, they can't because they choose not to be born again because they're rejecting the Savior because they love their sin more so and that's still a sad thing within the church today there's still people caught up in, in a lot of sin and and they love that sin see it's not the amount of sin by the way that's going to keep you away from god like murder or whatever those big ones we think in our head but it's sin in general that's going to keep you from the presence of god even if you sinned once in your entire lifetime that is enough to keep you from a relationship with the lord scary thing uh look at verse 13 this is uh, faith in jesus look at, it says no one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven that is the son of man who is in heaven oh interesting here in fact let's keep going we'll, we'll come back to that verse 14 and as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Um, so Jesus has been, he's been to heaven, so he can speak about heaven, right? And he can speak about heavenly things. Nicodemus can't speak about heavenly things because he's never been to heaven. So in fact, Jesus is in heaven at the same time. Did you guys catch that in verse, what is it, 14? So very interesting. Why? Because he's omnipresent he could be everywhere at the exact same time he lives outside of time so that makes sense right but um jesus by the way he's god so that's why he can do that in fact the bible says uh, in john 10 30 i and my father are one and, and uh thomas said in john 20 28 thomas answered and said to him my lord and my god to jesus in fact, in Isaiah 9, 6, in the Old Testament, For unto us a child is born, speaking of Jesus, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Wait a minute, Jesus is going to be called Mighty God? Yeah. Wait, in Isaiah, the same prophet, even God even told him that there is no other God. God even said there is no other God. There's no other God. Before I've, I've looked, there's no other. It's just me, God says in Isaiah. And yet God, the same God that's speaking to the prophet there, says, wait a minute, Jesus is going to come and he's God. Well, so which is it? Yes, he's, he's God. Yeah, God says of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God. So here's God speaking to Jesus, calling him God. 
Yeah, your your throne, O oh God, is a, a throne. It's forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. So I think what Jesus is saying is, you need to have faith in me because I am God Almighty, and and getting to heaven is something I know about because I'm there. That's what he's saying to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is still like, oh, what? <laughs> right? He's not getting it. And verse fourteen. Um, uh, Jesus is illustrating to uh, about Moses. You guys remember Pastor Dwight just spoke to us on it, so I won't go into detail. But people were getting bit by snakes there in the wilderness, and then and then uh, God spoke to Moses, put the staff out, and right in the snake, and then uh, yes. Technical correction: It was after they got bit by the snake. After they got bit by the snake. In case you guys caught that, thank you. I didn't even understand that. But yeah, it, it, once after they got bit by the snake, they're going to die. And all they had to do by faith is look to the, the pole, right, of, with the snake on it. And then they would be healed. So some people thought, that's the silliest thing. I would rather go get medicine. And I would go, you know, travel a couple hundred miles this way to that city over there, be seen by Mr. Doctor whosoever, whatever, and right? And so was that a correction? Sorry. <laughs> Good job, by the way, Bruce. Um, but instead they had to look by faith and just look to Jesus, you know, and that's, that's what Jesus is saying right here. And we just need to look to the cross by faith uh, to Jesus Christ. Look at verse uh, 15. This is salvation in Christ that whoever believes in him, Jesus should not perish, but have eternal life. And, and, but let's just keep going for God so loved the world that he gave, he gave it a gift, his only begotten son. It's a sacrifice that he made that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is why the Son of Man must be lifted up. It's because of God's love for you and me. Paul tells us in Romans 5, 8, um, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Amazing. Christ didn't die for us when we were perfect. It was in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. Man, uh, so that we can look to him by faith and we can be healed. We can be delivered from the, the sting of the serpent, if you will. By the way, that serpent, he, he comes as a, a form of like an angel of light, right? And he loves to deceive those in the church. And no matter what clothing, right, the, the snakes, they shed their their skin all the time just because they're a new skin they're still a snake right? still, they're still those slithery deceptive people you gotta be watchful on john 15 uh, verse 13 it says greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends he no longer calls us servants he calls us friends wow a friend of love because of his love is basically our position it's amazing and first john uh, chapter 4 verse 10 it says and this is love not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins so he is the means by which our sins are taken away uh, they are removed as far as the east is from the west there there our transgressions are are, are they're gone they're out of there right? He's thrown them in the sea of forgetfulness in that sense, right? So 2 Corinthians, and by the way, note this if you're taking notes, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, for he made him who know, knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's a key verse right there as far as understanding the gospel, because of the greatest demonstration that this world has ever seen is the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And it welcomes you and me right to the cross. And so that we can enter into a relationship with him. By the way, keep in mind the words that I'm saying. I'm not saying you get to go to heaven. It's not about the place. It's about the person, right? There's so much people that are caught up in, oh, I can't, oh, yeah, I'm going to heaven. How are you going to get that? Oh, I'm going to go to heaven. We, we give the wrong impression to people when we present the gospel. By the way, we're going to go over witnessing is one of our, our classes coming up at some point. Um, and we're going to, we're going to go over how to present the gospel and how to break it down in different, different styles and whatnot. But the gospel is the gospel, right? There's just different presentations on different people who I've seen in different ways I've done it. So we'll go over that 
aspect of it later on. Right now we're just going to look at what is the gospel? What does the scripture say? And there's a lot that the scripture has to say. Um, so um, look at verse 17. It says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Did Jesus Christ die for the whole world? Yes, he did. We do know uh, not all the world will have this salvation because, uh, because while we're free moral agents, if you will, we have the freedom of choice, right? And in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, uh, the, well, at the end, this is not, well, let's just read it. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it's a choice we all have to make to look to the cross of Jesus. But um, clearly, is it God's will that the whole world come to know him and have a relationship with him? Yes, it's very clear. That's why, that's, that's God's heart. In fact, in Romans 10, 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is anybody, it's a welcome. Hey, in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, this is one I used to hate, but I love it. It says, when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's a lot. To the rich man, he said, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. To some other people, they said, I can't do that. I'm sorry. I love you, Jesus. I love the knowledge. I love, I understand who you are. I, I agree that you are the son of God. I believe that you're you're uh, the deity, right? That he's 100% God. He's 100% man. But, you know, I just, I can't, I can't give this up because, you know, my, my child is more than you are to me or my money is more than you are to me or my car or you guys get where i'm going today there's a lot of idols that are out there and we don't realize it but people are placing these things before their relationship with god and it's very sad romans chapter 5 if you're taking notes here's another good one verse 18 it says therefore as through one man's offense judgment came to all men speaking of Adam, right? Resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteousness, speaking of Jesus, a righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. I love that verse. So the let's look at verse uh, 18. It says, in fact, let's just read this little portion here. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So, uh, in fact, in Romans chapter 8, that reminds me, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirits. So Jesus doesn't condemn us. Your lack of faith is what condemns you, right? Because you don't believe in his finished work on the cross. So we chose to condemn ourselves. By the way, that's the, uh, what is that called? The unpardonable sin, right? Or unforgivable sin. I think that, there you go. Uh, that's what it is. It's it's choosing not to believe in Jesus and, and receiving him. That's, that's how people volunteer, by the way, to go to hell. Hell's a place where the fire doesn't die. It's a place where the, the warm doesn't die. It's a place of darkness. It's a place of uh, absence from God. You're, you're away from, that's hell enough, right? Being away from the Lord. Um, and it's a scary place. Um, the reason why people don't believe is because they're, they're blinded by that light. Obviously, Jesus spoke it better than me here. This is a spiritual problem. It's not an intellectual problem, by the way. Um, and the reason you're condemned is because you don't come to the light. And the reason you don't come to the light is because your deeds are evil. 
even though outwardly you do good things, but the problem is on the inside, right? Outwardly, Nicodemus, hey, you're doing religious things, you're doing good works, you're doing good deeds, you're doing all this stuff on the outside, but you're disgusting on the inside and you're not welcomed in my presence because of your sin. Isn't that a scary thing if God told us that? But 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 God, look, I, I just gave, you know, $17 million to Florida and to, I gave it to this good deed and that good deed. And he's like, <laughs> it, it's, it's a scary place. Sadly, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, that's that express image, he's the reflection, he is the exact representation of who Jesus is should shine on them. So it's a spiritual problem. It's not a physical problem, right? Nicodemus didn't understand that. Now, here's the problem. The problem is Romans 3.23, right? We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all missed the mark, if you will, right? You just, we went this way. It didn't even go near the bullseye. You were way over there. We've all missed the mark. We've all sinned. And we delight in sin. And that's the problem. In fact, if the result of sin is Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you need to repent. You need to stop sinning. You need to fall on your face and, and if there's no fear of God, that's why I started with that. Some of you guys are like, why is he talking about the fear? I think this is the wrong class. I think, <laughs> what's, what is this guy talking about, right? But that's the reason why I brought you to that place. Because if you're not on your face, if you're not on your knees, if you're not trembling before your creator, then what are you, what are you repenting of? Where, where's the contrast? Your sin is still delightful to you. And you still stay in sin, even though you have a whole knowledge of God. But you're not going to be enter, entering into his kingdom because you're allowing that sin before the Lord, before he, he's, not, he's not in your heart. And it's a scary, scary place. Um, the, but here's the solution, right? And by the way, your sin, it's going gonna, gonna to keep you from the Lord. Here's the solution. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into this world. He died upon that cross. His blood shed for you and I covers our sins so that our sins are no more, right? And now what our account was has been gone. Now our account is his account. He's replaced his account, which is perfect, in our account. In other words, his righteousness has been accounted to your righteousness. Now you are righteous with him. And and uh, it was because Jesus was buried, is because he rose again the third day, right? That we can have life in him, eternal life, that is. That's that abundant life. And and by the way, 1 Peter 3, 18, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. In fact, in Romans chapter 5, uh, it's in verse 6, it says, For when he... When we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life and not only that but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation that intense you guys still with me by the way you guys you guys good you guys are great all right that was that's the rest of the verse all right uh, but but Jesus is the he's the only way to the Father, right? So John fourteen six says Jesus said that he is the way. He's the only way. He's the truth. He's the life. He's there's no one no one comes to the Father except through him. So we didn't need to work for this salvation. It was freely given to us. Remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's a very good verse right there. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, 
it's a gift that God, your creator, you're his created and he's given you a gift. What a mockery it is to reject a gift from your creator. And, and not of works lest anyone should boast. Notice that now that we're saved, we get to do good works, right? Now they come naturally. And this is what I was talking about earlier. That uh, in Ephesians 2, since we're there, the next verse says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so that's what God is doing. Uh, and another thing we got to realize too, by the way, Okay, we, we, we know the gospel, we know if we live for him, but you got to count the cost, okay? Uh, what happens after you receive the gospel? All of a sudden, there's all these trials and there's these tribulations that are happening all over the place, right? All of a sudden, you're getting punched in the face and, and your, your own family and your friends are betraying you and all this is happening and then some people come up to you and they're like, you just got to hold to the promises of God. Well, here's a promise you can hold on to. Guess what Jesus says in John 16, 33? He says, you will have tribulations, right? Amen? Amen. Yeah, whatever, you liars. <laughs> um, you're going to have, but be a good cheer, Jesus says, right? I have overcome the world. And what's another thing that happens when you count the cost? You enter into spiritual warfare, right? All of a sudden, there's all these spiritual attacks, and you're seeing things, or things are happening to you, and you're like, your dreams are going crazy. I know for me, when I was saved, not to say that this needs to happen to you, this is just me personally, but for three years straight, I kid you not, every single night was a nightmare, and it was like, it was always animals or dragons that were attacking my family or attacking me, and I was like, what is all? I wake up sweating and crying, and like, well, why am I having all of this? It's spiritual warfare. I got to get up and I just got to pray. I just got to seek the Lord. And it's just it's just something you're going to experience right away uh, when you give your life to the Lord, when you surrender your life to the Lord. And uh, But we know our weapons, this, uh, our weapons of uh, this warfare, they're not carnal. They're not of the flesh. It's not like you can go and, right? Bring it on, Satan. <laughs> He'll be laugh at you, right? Our, our weapons are what? We got prayer, man. We got Jesus. We got the name of Jesus. And, and so we've entered in to the other side of the war, right? Where now we don't even have to fight necessarily. Um, now it's Christ fighting all of our fights. And in the end, it's still him. We're all coming back riding on horses, right? So get ready. And, and we're riding down, so it's not that hard, right? If you don't, I've never rode on a horse. But we're coming in and God's like, boom, and poof, it's done, right? It's great. It's going to be wonderful. But turn with me to First John. I just want to end with this. First John, um, and, and one thing that we ought to do as believers now, once you understand that what the gospel is, once you've given your life to the Lord, or let's say you present the gospel to somebody, you need to encourage them to abide in Christ. John 15 talks about, you know, that, that uh, you know, you just got to abide, just just hang in there, just just chill out with Jesus, right? Go to First John uh, chapter 3, look at verse 4. Because uh, we may stumble, we may fall, but we're not going to stay in a lifestyle of sin, right? We, we need to continue to abide in Christ. And that's one of the deceptive uh, strategies of the enemy. He's going to make you think that, oh, you sinned. Look what you did. You, you just mocked Jesus because you, you gave your life to him, but here you are sinning again. But now it's your choice and you're, you're a new creation. And you're, this is not something you do like you used to anymore. And now there's this whole, you know, conviction, right, when you sin, and you can't sin. You just, you can't. But now we have the Holy Spirit, and we just got to keep keep staying in the, the game there, right? Stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. Because it's, it's and then you see the, um, uh, you see Jesus conquering again in your life. And those areas are just, they, they keep getting conquered, and there's new ones that come your way, isn't there? And it just keeps coming. But anyways, 1 John 3. Why am I saying that? Okay, whoever commits, look at verse 4. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. It says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him, little children. Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. 
He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So now you can say like Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, uh, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, right, of, of Christ, because it's the power of, of God to salvation, right, uh, to everyone who believes. So there's benefits, by the way, of knowing Christ, of understanding the gospel and receiving the gospel. Uh, in John 3, 16, we understand that one of those benefits that you believe in him is you have eternal life yeah and and the other one is that you're a new creation in christ jesus in fact let's see if i got it oh there's john 3 16 uh second corinthians 5 17 says therefore if anyone is in christ he is a new creation old things have passed away behold all things become new so now you are a new creation in christ uh third you how did you become a child of god well uh, John chapter 1 verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So now you have the right, the titleship, if you will, of being a child of God. In fact, if you're still there in 1 John, look at chapter 3 verse 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it didn't know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Wow. Just because you believed in his name. There's some awesome awesome things that are happening there in fact look at chapter 4 sorry I, I got carried away here look at chapter 4 verse 13 uh, at first John it says by this we know that we abide in him in he in us because he has given us of his spirit a holy his holy spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent the son as savior of the world whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So his name, the name of Jesus is very, very important. See, if you understand that Jesus is God, then according to 1 John, you are a Christian. You're born again. You understand who God is. But if you reject that Jesus is God, you're not saved, according to the word of God. Very, very scary uh, passage. Uh, in fact, so how should we live now, right? If we're believers in Christ, we understand the gospel, what should our life look like? In fact, if you're still there in 1 John, go back to verse 1, uh, 1 John chapter 4. It says, uh, Beloved, uh, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. You guys remember, by the way, just a little side note, the Gnostics back in the day, if you look at Colossians, Paul's uh, c combating against the Gnostics and the ascetics and the all of them, right? But what they believe that Jesus came in the spirits, right? And they didn't know, well, how did he die on the cross? Well, I don't know, he's in the spirit. He, was, he didn't really die because God's God and God's spirit. They believe that everything evil was uh, tangible. Everything material was evil, right? So everything spiritual was good. And so John is kind of combating against the Gnostics in that sense right here as well. So, because they didn't believe that Jesus actually came in the flesh. And this is part of your salvation. This is part of the gospel. You need to understand that Jesus Christ came in the flesh and that he's God Almighty. In fact, it says, and this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard and was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God little children have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world they are of the world therefore they speak 
as of the world and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. Uh, and then it goes on, you know, that God, uh, well, let's just keep reading, actually. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Uh, and so, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. See, the gospel is an invitation to a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not an invitation to a place. You know, the condition that we die in is the condition that you're going to stay in. If you choose not to choose Christ, then you're going to choose not to choose Christ when you die, and you're going to stay in that path, and that leads to hell. If you die in a condition of loving Christ and being with Christ, then you're going to continue going on in that path, right? So there is a hell, and it will last forever, but there are, is also our Creator, right? And His name is Jesus, and and uh, and that's that's I, I I plea with you guys, you know, as as believers, we need to influence one another onto the gospel. We need to be the salts of this world, right? A light to this world when we present the gospel. So. Hopefully, I gave you guys a lot, and I'm sure you guys are like, wow, um, because it was a lot, right? I did it on purpose, by the way, but um, understand, it, it's a simple gospel. It's the good news that Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose again uh, the third day of his burial, right? But he rose again the third day. Uh, and that's it. That's the gospel. And it's amazing when you present that, just a simple gospel to people. And, and then you just watch them break down what I love to do. We'll, well, we'll go over it later in the witnessing class. But you show them the scripture and let them read the scripture. And just watch the Lord transform them as you're speaking to them. And just watch the... Just watch. Just look at them. And it's just amazing. And you see the, the outcome later on when, when you know, it takes... The Thessalonica church took them three weeks, and they were mature in Christ. It's pretty amazing. Well, um, that's our first uh, study, and and these are they're kind of the basics in a sense. But obviously, as you can tell, that was kind of meaty, wasn't it? So it was more for the mature believer. But for if you're not a believer, you're understanding what the scripture says, and I think that's a good start right there. Speaking of the gospel, so. Um, it's just, it's for everyone in a sense, but it's God's word and it's, it's, a uh, it's amazing. Let's pray. Um, Lord, thank you so much, Lord, that we can enter into the throne of your presence, Lord, and we can come before you boldly, uh, that your throne of grace. And I just thank you that you've given us grace, Lord, that we can stand, that we can even be thankful unto you. Uh, Lord, you've enabled us to this grace that we can go out and live the life that you called us to, uh, being overcomers because of the blood that you shed on the cross. And we pray, Father, that we wouldn't, um, Lord, that we wouldn't take that lightly, Lord, uh, but rather that we would uh, take it to heart, Lord, knowing that what you did, uh, may it terrify us, Lord. May if anybody in this room right now is in sin, if anybody here is practicing sin, Lord, I pray you would convict them and that they would fall on their knees, that they would repent and they would turn to you, that they would know you, Lord, and that they would begin to experience that relationship that you called them to, Father, that they would spend time with you and understand uh, just that that sweetness, Father, that quality time that comes from you, Lord, that devotional time with you. And so I pray you would do your work, Lord, here in our hearts and in our, in our fellowship, and that you, by your grace, Lord, would uh, continue to lead us, Lord, and, and just train us, equip us, uh, to know your word, Father, we're we're yours, Lord. We're your children, and we want to be. Um, we want you, Father, to teach us all things. We don't want the world to teach us. Um, and I pray uh, that you would just watch over us, Lord. Keep us away from uh, those deceptive uh, leaders out there, those deceptive pastors that may uh, sway us from your word. And I pray you would teach us all things, and we know that you do. And I just thank you for who you are, Lord, in Jesus' name, Amen.